Can you zip me up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one second. Well, come on! All right, all right, let's not get into panic mode! Let's not make a big deal out of this thing, and we're never gonna get through this night. Well, I'm meeting your in-laws. I think I should look nice. My in-laws? Oh, my God. So, what do you think? Your old man can look pretty good when he wants to, huh? I don't like that tie. What's the matter with this tie? I've hardly worn it. It's too thin. They're wearing wide now. How do you know what kind of ties they wear? Go to any office building on 7th Avenue and tell me if there's anyone there wearing a thin tie like that. Go ahead. Oh, get the hell out of here. 7th Avenue. <laughs> do you think he should wear a tie like that? Huh? I think he should wear whatever tie he wants. We got to stop off and pick up a marble rye from Schnitzer's. It's out of our way. Why can't we pick up something at Lord's? It's right over here. No, we have to go to Schnitzer's. I'll show these people something about taste. <laughs> this is going to be fun. Thank God that's all. The mother seems to hit the sauce pretty hard. I didn't like that. And who doesn't serve cake after a meal? What kind of people? would kill them to put out a pound cake something. <laughs> so they didn't give you a piece of cake. Big deal. It is a big deal. You're supposed to serve cake after a meal. I'm sorry. It's impolite. Not impolite. It's stupid. That's what it is. You gotta be stupid to do something like that. Your father is absolutely right. We're sitting there like idiots drinking coffee without a piece of cake. <laughs> what is this? The marble ride? Oh, dear, I forgot to put out that, that bread they brought. We forgot to bring it in. No, I brought it in. They never put it out. Where is it? I don't know. Where'd you put it? Right over there. Well, it's gone. You stole the bread? What do you mean stole? It's my bread. They didn't eat it. Why should I leave it there? Because we brought it for them. Well, apparently, it wasn't good enough for them to serve. Is it possible they took it back? Who would bring a bread and take it back? Those people, that's who. I think they're sick. People right. take buses So we got to get two those ride. peoples, and those peoples are always, when someone says those people, we always know we're in the, in the zone of groups coming together. We get, you know, George's dad saying, I'm going to show those people something about taste, and then the, the uh, Americanized Protestant father-in-law, you know, commenting on George's family's uh, lack of propriety. And... What fascinates me about this clip, and why I think it's a great place to start, is that there's nothing explicitly Jewish about the clip. Um, George Costanza is not a Jewish character, though Jason Alexander does have some Jewish background. Um, and yet, there's something remarkably Jewish about this. Jerry Stiller, who plays George's father, is obviously a uh, comedic great. Um, we have marks of Jewish characters, characterization like George's exasperation with his mother, his father's obsession with the right kind of rye bread, which if you noticed, whatever the production team was screwed up, they didn't even get a rye bread, it's a challah, like to, to make it even more Jewish. Um, his parents kvetch about propriety, but they themselves come off as rude and petty. And to me, this clip exemplifies something I want to look at together uh, today, which is, how did Jews or Jewishness in the context of the 1990 sitcom become marked by behaviors totally shorn of explicit Judaism? And instead, cultural markings like dress, emotionality, and food coming to stand in for Jewishness rather than overt references to something about Judaism. Oh, I thought I heard somebody. Yeah, all right. Um, the, this, yeah, can you not hear me? Oh, I think we'll do questions at the end. We'll do questions at the end. Yeah, so this, this phenomenon of sort of a Jewishness that is marked by things uh, that are cultural or sartorial or relating to cuisine, um, I think has to start with an understanding of who these Jews are. Um, and this strand of Ashkenazi American Jewry um, comes from a specific moment in American history and in America's concept of itself as a nation. And so I want to go back to my ancestors for just a minute um, because a large number of immigrants to this country came from Jews 
in Eastern Europe between 1880 and 1924. And the reason why we stop in 1924 is because in 1924, the United States passed uh, the Johnson-Reed Act, which put quotas on where people could come from. And this was an act designed to um, eliminate immigration from Eastern Europe, from Africa, and from Asia in favor of Western Europe. And as a result, the wave of Jewish immigration stops. It's worth noting that while the amount of Jews relative to the US population, two million Jews, give or take, settle in the US over this 40-year period, um, that's a very small percentage of the 90 million uh, of the population of the US at the time, relative to the East Coast, where most of them settled, the East Coast has a population of 25 million or almost 26 million. That, that's, almost a good, uh, that's almost a good percent. And so this is a very visible minority. And the immigration regime in this country continues to change. But this wave of immigrants is going to play an outsized role in the imagination of America and how it conceives of itself. In 1965, an act is passed called the Hart Seller Act. This opens up immigration once again, and it ends the quota system. It particularly is interested in immigrants who are coming from Soviet-controlled countries. And the reasoning is we're in the middle of the Cold War. We want to attract people that cannot live under communism. And in the process, we want to make a name for ourselves as a country that can attract the oppressed. In signing the act, President Johnson gives a speech. And we're going to hear a piece of the speech. And it's the only time that you'll have to listen to somebody who's not um, a sitcom in the 1990s. But what I, what I want to alert you to is the degree to which President Johnson's speech creates a myth in which the United States has a history of successfully integrating immigrants. That for over four decades, that for over four decades, the immigration policy of the United States has been twisted and has been distorted by the harsh injustice of the national origins quota system. Under that system, the ability of new immigrants to come to America depended upon the country of their birth. Only three countries were allowed to supply 70% of all the immigrants. Families were kept apart because a husband or a wife or a child had been born in the wrong place. Men of needed skill and talent were denied entrance because they came from Southern or Eastern Europe or from one of the developing continents. This system violated the basic principle of American democracy, the principle that values and rewards each man on the basis of his merit as a man. It has been un-American in the highest sense because it has been untrue to the faith that brought thousands to these shores even before we were a country. Today, with my signature, this system is abolished. We can now believe that it will never again shatter the gate to the American nation with the twin barriers of prejudice and privilege. America was... Our beautiful America was built by a nation of strangers from a hundred different places or more. They have poured forth into an empty land, joining and blending in one mighty and irresistible tide. The land flourished because it was fed from so many sources, because it was nourished by so many cultures and traditions and peoples.
So I saw some, some, uh, some positive uh, nods of affirmation and some applause for the Johnson speech. It is, a major, um, it is a major moment in American history and in the history of American liberalism. And what I want to focus on is this idea he's creating, he's, he's cultivating a narrative of America in which America is a land of immigrants. And it's a narrative we all know and, and we celebrate, I hope we celebrate. The Jewish immigrants who came between 1880 and 1924, who, have now, who are now in their middle age or older and they have children of their own, they are gonna play a really important role in this myth-making of America as a country of immigrants. And I say myth not to say it's not true, but myth in the sense of creating a, a story we tell about ourselves as we identify ourselves as American. The Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe are proof positive that Johnson's vision of America works. And so Jews have to be visible. We have to be visible, and we have to be visibly American. And this puts producers of movies and TV, many of whom are Jewish themselves, in a little bit of a bind. On one hand, we need characters who can be identified by their difference. And on the other hand, we want those characters to be American. So they have to be different but not too different. A scholar, Todd, Todd Glitton, call, uh, coins a phrase this way. Uh, he says it this way, which I love. He says, Jewish characters were written to be palatable to a market of, quote, hypothetical anti-Semites, ready to switch channels at the first sign of a Stein. And, and, I, and I think there's something to that. People are producing mass media. They want it to reflect an image of America, uh, the, the image that America has its, of itself, and they don't want to be too off-putting. So by the time we get to the 1990s, when the sons and daughters of those immigrants and maybe even some of their uh, grandchildren have now come of age and are active participants in Hollywood and in the making of TV shows, we begin to get features of Jewish identity that I'd like to call today the parenthetical Jew. And parenthetical Jew which is uh, not my term, it's a term coined by a uh, professor of literature, Naomi Seidman. And the parathetical Jew is the, is the image of a, a character who is first portrayed as uniquely American, but has some quirky traits that might be read as Jew. But that Jew, this imaginary Jew, is in parentheses. And the parenthetical Jew gives TV writers and actors a place to play with Jewish identity without being explicit in Judaism. And we'll see uh, one, I think, pretty, pretty clear example of that here. So, you know, we have Rachel Green and Monica, both of whom are Jewish characters, and they're sort of winking to the camera a little bit with the name Eddie Moskowitz. This is, this is Jew light. There's nothing, uh, nothing particularly deep about their Jewishness, except that it gets remarked on every now and again. And I, and I want to just take a second before we go into uh, more clips. Um, you know, this kind of critique, the kind of critique that I'm sort of trying to bring you towards today, um, is critique that I, I want us to walk away with a better understanding of some of the things behind, the, behind this comedy, some of which are less than ideal manifestations of our values, as Jews, as Americans, but I, I don't want to remove the space for people to take aesthetic pleasures from these. I think these are very funny. And I think having critiques of a piece of media can coexist with finding something funny. Um, and, I, and I invite you to join me in sort of sitting between um, uh, awareness of, of discomfort and also uh, humor. So 
Seinfeld is the ultimate in this parenthetical Jew. Seinfeld is created by Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David. It is obviously in its reception a very Jewish show. It pre uh, presents an image of New York that is dominated by second generation immigrants from Eastern Europe. Um, but very rarely do the characters do anything explicitly Jewish. And in this clip here in the, the funeral, we're gonna see uh, a remarkably sanitized funeral for a remarkably Jewish character, Aunt Manya. I actually like ponies. I was just trying to make conversation. <laughs> what time is your game? 2.45. And what time is the funeral? Two o'clock. You know, I can't believe you're even considering not playing. We need you. You're hitting everything. He has to go. He may have killed her. <laughs> Me? What about you? You brought up the pony. Oh, yeah, but I, I didn't say I hated anyone who had one. <laughs> I, I just don't see what purpose it's going to serve you going. I mean, you think dead people care who's at their funeral? They don't even know they're having a funeral. It's not like she's hanging out in the back going, I can't believe Jerry didn't show up. Maybe she's there in spirit. How about that? If you're a spirit and you can travel to other dimensions and galaxies and, and find out the mysteries of the universe, you think she's going to want to hang out at Drexel's funeral home on Ocean Parkway? George, I met this woman. She is not traveling to any other dimensions. <laughs> Do you know how easy it is for dead people to travel? It's not like getting on a bus. One second. It's all mental. 50 years they were married. Now he's moving to Phoenix. Phoenix? What's happening with his apartment? I don't know. They've been in there since, like, World War II. Rent's $300 a month. $300 a month? Oh, my God. Although this may seem like a sad event, it should not be a day of mourning. For Manya had a rich, fulfilling life. She grew up in a different world, a simpler world, with loving parents, a beautiful home in the country, and from what I understand, she even had a pony. <laughs> oh, how she loved that pony. <laughs> Even in her declining years, whenever she would speak of it, her eyes would light up. Its lustrous coat, its flowing mane, it was the pride of Krakow. Well, game's starting just about now. It was good that the two of you came. It was so a nice Banya, gesture. I'm not a doctor yet, Uncle Marty. I'm, I'm just Krakow. an intern. I can't has a has a has a funeral with very little uh, overtly Jewish uh, content, and yet we clearly understand Ocean Parkway, Krakow. This is an Eastern European story. This is a story of a Jewish family from Eastern Europe coming to Brooklyn. So I'm curious. I'm curious about these markers of of Jewishness that are so separate from from conversations about Jewish identity, from explicit uh, naming of Jewish ritual or Jewish history, um, but that are still clearly read uh, and meant to be read as Jewish. I want to talk about three patterns in 1990 sitcoms, um, three ways that Jews are marked as different without uh, giving away something super separate, something that, some separation that can't be bridged. I want to talk about Jewish class, meaning the, uh, the phenomenon of Jews being presented as déclassé. I want to talk about Jewish mothers and Jewish children, which it's out there in the, in the, in the, in the ether. Um, and, uh, and I want to talk about big machers who don't tip. <laughs> and, in each of these, and in each of these tropes, I think you'll see um, behavior that is coded as Jewish, but that can easily be moved away from. So we're going to start with uh, some clips from Mad About You and The Nanny, and we're going to talk about sort of class expectations. 
So in each of these clips, the, the Jewish character, that's going to be Paul Reiser in Mad About You or Fran Drescher in The Nanny, uh, they're going, their Jewishness is going to be expressed as a lack of class, an inability to sort of co-mingle with the higher classes in society. Um, let's start with a, with a meeting of the neighbors that goes wrong. It's cold and it's wrong. Oh, good pineapple. I hate my life so much. Don't worry, you can pick it off. You can't pick it off. The pineapple juice is all baked in there now. <laughs> what kind of sick, twisted person puts pineapple on pizza? The people in 11C. Yeah, well, so what do you, what do you do? I'm gonna do you exchange know? it with 11C. They probably have ours. Aren't you happy? Neighbors are nothing but trouble. We're doing a good deed. Yeah, okay. I don't, I don't want it. Neither do I. You take it. I'm holding the pizza. Pizza holder holds the knocker. Take it. Hi. Oh, don't tell me. Let me guess. We have each other's pizza pies. I think so. Uh, we're in 11D. I'm Jamie Buckman. This is my husband, Paul. Hi, how are you? Hal Conway, a pleasure. Maggie, it's our neighbors, the Buckmans, from 11D. <laughs> You're 11D, aren't you? I think your bedroom's right next door to our kitchen. We hear you through the wall sometimes. Oh, my God. That's her. <laughs> it's quite all right. I think 11G hears us. Actually, 11G is away for the week, so you guys go crazy. <laughs> Are you from London? Uh, no, Cambridge, actually. Um, Hal's teaching at Columbia this year. Diplomacy. Well, that must be a tough subject to teach, huh? Especially in New York. <laughs> I wanted to exchange the pizzas, but Hal was afraid it might start some sort of ugly hallway incident. Uh, stranger things have happened. The Peloponnesian Wars were started by a misunderstanding over a crate of figs. Really? No, I'm joking. Actually, there are extremely complex geopolitical forces at work. The Spartans. Darling, <laughs> darling, I'm sure they've got better things to do than listen to you chattering on about the Greeks. No, 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 it's fascinating. Honey, honey, just give nice people their pizza, OK? <laughs> it's been lovely to meet you. You too. We've heard so many horror stories about New Yorkers. It's nice to know you're not raving loons. <laughs> This is a very spoiled bad dog, Sophie. Oh, what is she? Sort of a scruffy little Scotty Mutt thing? No, she's a she's a Cairn Terrier show dog. She's a purebred. That's the punchline. She's a purebred dog. I apologize. What what happened to this thing? Hmm. Um, so we have our patrician neighbors who are so obviously in distinction with. Uh, Paul Reiser fumbling about and Helen Hunt knocking off the door knocker. And we also have uh, references to uh, the dog being a mutt or the dog being a purebred. The dynamic that's set up here in which the straight man, the comedic straight man, is played by the non-Jew to, to, the, to the bumbling Jew is, an in, is, 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 a, is a conversation about class. It's a distinction born out of class. This is going to be... Uh, even more profound in what I think is a great set of scenes. This is The Nanny, and it's an extended quote to My Fair Lady, which is, of course, a story of a lower class woman who is being trained to become high class. And think about the message that's being communicated that the overtly Jewish behaviors are something that can be trained away. Hmm. Someone help me. Uh... Yeah. Well, that's fine. I'll get it here. Hey, it, no, it's an ad. Um, I'm playing it in YouTube, but it wouldn't play full screen in the. Doesn't matter. It's okay. Sorry. Me and those ladies. I wouldn't know where to begin. Her clothes, her hair, her voice, her laugh. Boy, you came up with that list pretty fast. <laughs> it would be a monumental task. Impossible. Oh, go for it. I'm an empty canvas, a blank slate. An etch-a-sketch right after you shake it. 
All right, you're on. We have 24 hours to turn this breath of fresh air into a stale, pretentious snob. In other words, Miss Babcock. <laughs> All right, George, I think he's got it. <laughs> Round tones, Miss Fine. How now, brown cow? How now, brown... Oh. Enough with the marbles. I've swallowed three and passed two already. <laughs> How now, brown cow? Not that there's going to be any cows at the party. That's what you think. <laughs> party, Miss Fine. Yes, let's try to capture that elusive letter R. What? Your accent, it's so odd. It's inescapable. I don't see an R coming out of your mouth. <laughs> That's because we're British. Yes, we can say anything we like and people think it's Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> All right, repeat after me. Mark went on a lark after dark in Central Park. Gee, I hope he has a gun. <laughs> Miss Fine, focus. All right, but the Kennedys don't have an R between them. They pack the car in the river and get away with it. <laughs> No, it's all wrong. I'll say this book is flattening my whole poof. It, it's your hips, Miss Fine. Oh, I've never had any complaints before. It, it's a way they move from side to side. Oh, I've never had any complaints before. <laughs> What's the matter? These ladies don't have hips? Not really, no. And flat bums. <laughs> <laughs> but who's looking? <laughs> Perhaps we should move on to conversation, sir. Oh, now that's my area of speciality. I am never at a loss for words. There are several topics which are appropriate in any social setting. The weather, current events, literature. I'll take literature for a hundred, Alex. <laughs> what, I shouldn't laugh? If you must, try a soft, breathy... <laughs> and close. <laughs> No, no, no. I can't believe you're knocking my style. I'm known for my style. Except for that brief cornrow period after I saw a 10. <laughs> oh, what about this beige frock? That's my dress bag. <laughs> Two armholes and a string of pearls. Good work. This is the fish knife, the steak knife, the salad knife, and the butter knife. You know, one amazing Ginzu could do it all. <laughs> all right, let's start again. <clears throat> the salad course has arrived, and you pick up your... Mm, the salad fork. And wrong again. That is your shrimp fork. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm getting shrimp salad. <laughs> all right, we've, we've finished our meal. What do we do now? Well, if you're at my mother's house, you open your pants and flop on the couch. <laughs> Guess again. Oh, yeah. Tart, but refreshing. No, Miss Fine, that is your finger bowl. It's for washing the fingers. What, these people can't afford wet naps? I say, old man, we did it. We did it. We did it. We said that we would do it. And indeed, we did. <laughs> Hello. How do you do? How now, brown cow? So the nanny, uh, I think in particular, I think holds up really well. And I think part of the reason it holds up really well is how Franz got this heart of gold that comes through her, her difference. She ends up marrying uh, Sheffield, the, the handsome British man in later seasons. Um, but once again, her essential difference is boiled down to something changeable. With a little bit of refinement, we can, we can dust the, get the dust off and make an American out of her. And I think that is, the, the, that is what's going to underpin every stereotype or every uh, marked Jewish quality that we're going to see today. But I want to move away from class and towards psychology because the Jewish mother uh, is ubiquitous 
as a character um, and a caricature in not just comedy, but of course in literature. And the Jewish mother as an archetype goes back well before the 1990s. Women in particular, both in the minds of anti-Semites and in the minds of uh, Jewish literati themselves, has been identified as sort of the signifying Jew. The, the Jewish woman is the site of the difference. Um, and, and this becomes uh, clear if anybody both looks at anti-Semitic racist, racist ideology, um, but as well in uh, you know, Portnoy's complaint. Um, the, the, the phenomenon of Jewish mothers and their Jewish children is saying that Jewishness is a, a matter of psychology. It's a difference between you and your, and your neurotic previous generation, and that too can be trained out of you. So we're gonna see a couple of examples of Jewish mothers here as depicted on TV. Um, one thing to note is that there's uh, going to be both a male and a female child. Um, and what to look for are markers of the woman being portrayed as overly involved in her child's life, which has a connotation since Freud of some sort of damaging quality, um, but also a, a domineering relationship to the child's peers, which again indicates that the old generation may be coming in and meddling with the good assimilation that's happening in the younger generation. And so again, this is gonna be an archetype that's going to invite us to be different, but changeable. We'll start with George, who has suddenly become a hand model. I always knew you had beautiful hands. I used to tell people, Frank, didn't I used to talk about his hands? Who the hell did you ever mention his hands to? I mentioned his hands to plenty of people. You never mentioned it to me. Hand me an emery board. I always talk about your hands, how they're so soft and milky white. No, you never said milky white. I said milky white! <laughs> Scissor. Don't hand them to me with the point facing out! I'm sorry. You're sorry? I'll try to be more careful. I hope so. <laughs> Georgie, oh. Georgie, would you like some jello? Why'd you put the bananas in there? George likes the bananas! So let him have bananas on the side! All right, please! Please! I cannot have this constant bickering. Stress is very damaging to the epidermis. Now, I have an important photo session in the morning. My hands have got to be in tip top shape. So please, keep the television down and the conversation to a minimum. But Georgie, what about the jello? I'll take it in my room. <laughs> well, we're gonna get some more insight into uh, the Costanza's uh, intergenerational dynamics. Hey, my parents are just as crazy as your parents. How can you compare your parents to my parents? My father has never thrown anything out, ever. <laughs> my father wears his sneakers in the pool. <laughs> sneakers! My mother has never set foot in a natural body of water. Listen carefully. <laughs> My mother has never laughed, ever. Not a giggle, not a chuckle, not a tee hee. Never went ha. <laughs> Smirk? Maybe. And I'm moving back in there. I told you I'd lend you the money for the rent. No, 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 no. Borrowing money from a friend is like having sex. It just completely changes the relationship. <laughs> oh. All right, I'm ready. You know, I still don't understand. Why do you want to move back in with your parents? I don't want to. I'm out of money. I got $714 in the bank. Well, move in here. What's that? <laughs> Why doesn't he just move in here? Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm gonna move in with him. He doesn't even let you use the toilet. You can move in with me if you want. Thank you. I, uh, that might not work out. Careful, careful with the suitcases. We just painted. Hello, Mrs. Costanza. Hello, Hello Kramer. Costanza. Close the door. Well, I gotta bring in some more stuff. More stuff? Yep. How much is there? There's more. So, how are you, Jerry? Fine, Miss Costanza. Hey, I got a terrific job for you. Nah, not interested. <laughs> no, no, it, it's really funny. There's these two Tell guys... Tell it to the audience. <laughs> Here, I made some bologna sandwiches. Bologna? Nobody eats bologna anymore. What are you talking about? Have a sandwich. Nothing. Oh, stop it. You don't want one, Kramer? Uh, no thanks. I think you're all a little touched in the head. You're so worried about your health? You're young men. I really don't eat it. What am I gonna do with all these sandwiches? Will you take them home? Give them to someone in your building? I don't know if I feel comfortable handing out bologna sandwiches in the building. All right. That's it. Anything else? No, that's it. Oh, I gotta go move the car. All right. Well, I guess we'll be going. What, you going? Yeah. <laughs> well, what, what are you doing later? Uh, Lane and I are going out to dinner with Kramer and his new girlfriend. Really? Yeah, you can't believe this woman. She's one of these low talkers. You can't hear a word she's saying. You're always going, excuse me, what was that? Uh, maybe I'll meet you. No, George, we're going out to eat tonight with your father. Oh. Okay. I'll talk to you, Lynn. Yeah, take it easy. Yeah, poor George. Um, you know, again, we see this... Uh, <laughs> the marker of, of George's weirdness suddenly becomes clear. George's parents aren't in every episode, but we, we, he suddenly becomes this uh, either overly entitled in the case of his beautiful hands, or he just shrinks away. Um, and, and the show seems to be telling us that everything we know that is different about George is rooted in some psychological dynamic with his parents. And there's a subtext that if only he could get past it, he could be normal like the rest of us. And I think that is key to understanding these parenthetical Jews, the, these Jews marked by their side, their side characteristics, um, is that there's always an exit strategy, usually implicit um, in, in the show. Um, I think the point about Jewish mothers is, is easy to make, but there's one more clip that I think is just great, and it has to do with Passover, and so I, I, I feel in, uh, I have to show it. Um, and this is Nanny Fran bringing her, her Gentile family home for, for, uh, for Seder. Happy Pesach! <laughs> so do we say that right? Beautiful. <laughs> Well, I hope this brisket goes with what you're serving. Oh, it's perfect with potato latkes. Mm -hmm. Assuming that you brought some. <laughs> I just want to thank you, Sylvia, for inviting me. Oh, please, Niles, you like family. Is there anything else I can do? Well, you prepared the food. I guess it's only right that you have the pleasure of serving it, too. <laughs> Would you start with the gefilte fish, and maybe you'll make a little radish rosette? <laughs> Sweetheart, before you make yourself comfortable, would you bring Uncle Morty his holiday hair? <laughs> Uh, hi, everybody. Mr. Sheffield. Happy Passover. Uh, Miss Fine, well, where's Margaret? Why isn't she with you? Well, let's see. Going to a club with Johnny Depp or sucking on whitefish bones. <laughs> oh, I see. She's going to finish out the day, then she's fired and going to college. Uh, well, actually, I sort of let her make that decision. You what? Are you out of your mind? Right, tomorrow I'll fire her, but first I'll practice on you. Shh. <laughs> this is the holiday where we don't yell and then stuff ourselves. Why on this night do we eat bitter herbs? 
to symbolize the bitter and cruel way we were treated under Pharaoh. Why on this night do we dip our foods in salt water? To remind us of the tears we shed. Why on this night do we recline on a pillow? Because once we were slaves and now we are a free people. Oh, that was beautiful, sweetheart. You forgot the last question. Oh. When is Daddy gonna marry my daughter already? <laughs> that question was to remind us of my suffering. <laughs> So Mama Fine also, uh, like like Mama Costanza, can be can be involved in her in her child's life. So uh, you know, there's a lot that we could unpack about the Jewish mother as a figure, um, and we haven't really talked about gender, and we haven't really talked about psychology as sort of a concept. But in the context of of 90s TV, I just want to include it as just another way in which Jews are depicted as changeably different, okay? Now, I picked the, the cheap macher, uh, macher being Yiddish for a uh, guy who's got a lot that he could be giving, big shot. And um, I picked this for a reason as, our, as the last uh, trait that I, wanna that I wanna demonstrate. Because this one, I, th I would argue, you start to slide a little bit towards more overt forms of anti-Semitism. The notion of Jews as cheap is not a benign concept. It's an old concept. It's born in Christian Europe conceptions of Jews. But sanitized through the lens of the sitcom, where again, Jewishness isn't essentially different. It's just quirky and easy to work around. The cheap macher as a figure is somebody who we laugh about, we being the audience. Um, and so I include it not to say it's the same as the Jewish mother, you know, in a, from a moral standpoint, or, or whether or not it's more, I'm not arguing that it's less objectionable, I think it's more objectionable than the other traits, but it's an example with a little bit more spice of, again, what happens when you sanitize uh, what it means to be Jewish into, a, into these sets of traits. So we're gonna look at two, two machers, and uh, the first one's our, our buddy George. This could have been a, just a whole talk about George. I told her the truth. Oh, my God. It's OK. <laughs> it's unheard of. She asked me to. So you lie. <laughs> what did you tell her? I told her that she was pretentious. Pretentious? <laughs> the woman has my tax papers. You told her she's pretentious? The IRS. They're like the mafia. They can take anything they want. How would you like it if someone told you the truth? Like what? What could they say? There are plenty of things to say. Like what? Uh, I'm bald? What is it specifically? Is, is there an odor I'm not aware of? What, give me one. You sure? Yes. OK. You're extremely careful with money. What? Oh, forget it. I'm cheap? You think I'm cheap? See? How could you say that to me? I can't believe this. How could you say that to me? You asked. Too. You should have lied. Ah, so should you. Okay, wait a second. Wait a second. What happened to my papers? I mean, I'm not really working right now. I know. When I was working, I spent, baby. <laughs> yeah, I know. Champagne, limos, cigars. What happened to the papers? She put them in a pocketbook. There's one more clip here about the cheap mafia. And, and is that relevant? just worth introducing is that one was just George. Here we're going to see the cheap macher playing out between a father or a father-in-law and a son. Ross is marrying Rachel Green in Friends, um, and they're out for dinner. And we'll see what happens. But I want you to pay attention to the differing attitudes between the old generation and the new generation. Oh, 
They found rust. You know what rust does to a boat? Gives it a nice antique look. <laughs> rust is boat cancer, Ross. Well, I'm sorry. When I was a kid, I lost a bike to that. <laughs> Excuse me for a moment, will you please? I want to say goodnight to the Levines before we go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> hey, stop. It's not that bad. Yeah. Oh. Uh-oh. I think your dad must have added wrong. He only tipped, like, 4%. Yeah. <clears throat> That's daddy. That's daddy? What, doesn't it bother you? You're a waitress. Yes, it bothers me, Ross, but... You know, if he was a regular at the coffee house, I'd be serving him sneezers. So? So, Ross, I bugged him about this a million times. He's not going to change. Do you really serve people sneezers? <clears throat> well, um, I don't. All right, kids, ready? Yes. Let's Thanks hit again, it. Dr. Green. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I think I forgot my receipt. Oh, uh, you don't need that. <clears throat> Why not? The, the carbon, it's messy. <laughs> I mean, it gets on your fingers and causes the, the uh, night blindness. <laughs> what is this? Who we'll put a 20 down here? Huh? Oh, yeah, that would be me. Um, <laughs> I, have, I have a problem. I, I tip way too much, way, way too much. It's a sickness, really. Yeah, it is, it is. We really, really have to do I know, something. I know. Excuse me. You think I'm cheap? Oh, Daddy, you know, he didn't mean huh? anything by that. He really didn't. Nothing I do means anything, really. <laughs> <laughs> this is nice. I pay $200 for dinner, you put down 20 and you come out looking like Mr. Big Shot. You really want to be Mr. Big Shot? Oh. Okay. Here, I'll tell you what. You pay the whole bill, Mr. Big Shot, all right? Well, Mr. Big Shot is better than wet head. <laughs> So, in the context of, first of all, in both clips, it's worth noting, clearly they're aware that cheap has a particular connotation because you could hear a pin drop both, in both cases. Somebody's accused, and then it's George and, uh, and uh, Rachel's dad, Mr. Green, Dr. Green, who say, you think I'm cheap, right? So there is this awareness, I think, by the writers that they're playing with something uh, with a dark history. So... So we have Jews as declassé, we have Jews as neurotic, and we have Jews as cheap, as these markers that make Jews uh, the center of 1990 sitcoms. In between, I want to get this number right, um, in between 1989 and 2001, so that's 12 years, but the 90s basically, 33 sitcoms feature Jewish protagonists. So Jews are at the center, we're at the center of this enterprise, and specifically Ashkenazi Jews, right? These are all kind of defined within a particular immigrant tradition. And in trying to understand what do we make of this, like what do we make of the amount of comedy that can be generated by the parenthetical Jew, um, I want to introduce another concept, um, which is... Whoop, concept of race. And I'm not here to ask the question that I think smarter people than me can struggle with, which is, is are Jews white? I don't think that's my question. But I want to think with whiteness for a little bit to understand what is this Americanism, what is this myth of America that in which ethnic difference can suddenly detach, in which Jew Jewishness or Judaism becomes hidden and Jewishness becomes a set of quirky traits. So, thinking along those lines, meaning what does whiteness do to Judaism, or to Jewishness, um, I want to read you a quote by a scholar, David Schraub, who wrote an amazing paper um, just uh, in, in, in the late part of the last decade about this question, what does whiteness as a concept in America do to Judaism? And he gives, gives an example. And the example he gives is that an American Jew whose grandparents immigrated from Austria might unambiguously benefit from white privilege when passing a highway patrol car, 
but not enjoy it in any way whatsoever when white supremacists are looking for a target to harass. Which is to say, the question, are Jews white, is, is reduction, reductive and doesn't do any good. But clearly, Jewishness in America, especially within this community of, that, that draws back to the 1880s to 1920s, there's whiteness involved in melting into the melting pot. So what is whiteness? <clears throat> so typically, scholars think about whiteness as um, access to power and privilege that exists in unremarkable ways. So a person experiencing whiteness thinks of themselves as just a person. It's access through um, set institutions, through the state. It is a phenotype. It's based on visual perception, phenotype meaning you know, visual perception of skin color. But it's not just a phenotype. It is the natural baseline in America by which other groups are measured. Becoming American is shifting towards a kind of whiteness. Access, again, and I think of it in terms of a verb, in terms of accessing something. You can access something. One of the hallmarks of, and this is not just a Jewish story, this is an Irish story, and an it's Italian story, and it's a German story, of whiteness in America is that um, the particularities of the group melt away in favor of being characterized as American. And, and that hiddenness is what clues me on to thinking that race may be at play in short, stripping Jews of our particularity in 1990 sitcoms. We are, we are no longer uh, visibly different in ways that can't be fixed because we've become vis visibly American. We have access to the things that being American means. Now, of course, with us, <clears throat> given the history of anti-Semitism, it's never quite so simple. Because for many anti-Semites, not only are Jews white and worthy of condemnation, but we epitomize whiteness. We are the most powerful. We control all the institutions. And so for Jews, this question of race is, is always going to be complicated because anti-Semitism is such a pernicious discourse, and it can just get in all the cracks of everything going on. But I maintain that over the course of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and by the 90s, by the end of the Cold War, as America really comes to pride itself as a place where difference can float away, where the American polity is a polity of many different people who come together, the way that's marketed on television becomes, it, Jews become invisible and yet prominent in a way that I think whiteness also challenges us to become invisible and yet prominent. And I've alluded to the fact that this is only about a particular um, subgroup of Jews, um, of which I am a member. Um, and there's another pernicious outcome, I think, of this intersection of race and Jewishness beyond just how it manifests in comedy. Um, and I want to draw attention to a really important um, speech that was given here at Central Synagogue by Rabbi Bookdahl in the uh, summer of 2020. Um, and there, Rabbi Bookdahl, the, the leader of the community, um, gave what I think is going to be one of the more important speeches in Jewish thought when we look back on this period. And she talked about race and Jewishness weaving in the history of American racism, race science, the, the racist science beloved by the Nazis, and her own personal history. And what was clear from the sermon was that American whiteness does not only do things to Jews who become melted in, this, in, in, the, in the sort of melting pot and strained away of their particularity, it also creates divisions within our community, um, particularly with Jews of color. A landmark 2021 study revealed all the ways in which in the American Jewish community we, f we are not doing right by our siblings of color within the Jewish, within the Jewish people. And I don't think that American comedy, or 1990s comedy, is behind injustice. I'm not making a claim of causality, that because of this comedy, we have this problem in our, in our Jewish community. But I do think, now that America has had 30 years to watch these TV shows and to think of Jews in a particular way, a particular way that is marked not by essential difference, not by traumatic history, but by quirky moms, cheap dads and, uh, 
and you know, low class behavior, we have this image that people in America walk around with of what it means to be Jewish that excludes a whole bunch of our community. So, I hope I haven't ruined uh, comedy for you. Um, there is great comedy happening. There's great comedy that has happened. I was going to um, end with a clip of Tiffany Haddish's Bat Mitzvah, which is an excellent document. You should check that out. But I do want some time for questions. Um, so I'm going to end there. Phil, thank you so much. We are at time. We have, we have hit our time limit, but if we take questions for the next two or three minutes, quick questions with quick answers. We can totally do that. Are there any lingering questions here in the room? All right, I see one in the front. I see one here in the side. Hi, Phil. I really enjoyed this. Um, I also think it's important uh, to notice that Jesus... Uh, even in the Christian tradition, it has become very white. And, uh, I mean, 2,000 years ago, he was essentially a Jew who lived in Palestine, and he was not white with light brown hair and blue eyes. Yep, yep. All right, another question, and then coming back. This is a very simple, stupid question. I, I did not watch Seinfeld. I always thought Costanza was an Italian-American. Was that deliberate in the writers that they gave him a non-Jewish name, but he acts Jewish? All right, another good question. And we'll take a third question as well. Um, I just might want to make a comment. So you said Jews were like quirky, cheap, or um, what was the thing? No, uh, no class, right. Well, how about this character? Like, this is a character that was kind of Jewish, but not So back in Bewitched, this is the 60s, they had this nosy neighbor, a Yenta. She was Gladys Kravitz, no relation to Lenny. And it was like, uh, it was never spoken that she was a Jew, but like, she was a Jew. She was a quirky Yenta next door. The other thing about the Italian thing, let me <coughs> just say something about that. Um, Jews and Italians play each other all the time. Um, one of the most outrageous examples, I think, is um, Golden Girls. Now, you have a case of uh, Estelle Getty and, um, what's her name? Uh, yeah. And B. Arthur, who are really Jews, and Jews are famous for going to Florida, and yet they turned them both into Italians. It was so unnecessary because they're both Jews, and Jews go to Florida a lot. But Jews playing Italians, you know, the funds are, you know, the funds, but it's a very common thing. It's not unusual, unique at all. But it was oh, one other thing that, that thing that, no, just like this. So the thing about uh, the, the anti Semitism thing, uh, so that was Jews with Jews. And kind of the same thing with Costanza and um, uh, uh, Dreyfus, Elaine, because she is also part Jewish, and it was like Jews with Jews about cheapness. It was interesting. There was no real goy in the room anyway. Right. That's why I did. All right, and we have two last questions for you. I'm told they are questions for you, Phil, from, the, from our Zoom room. Sure. Um, so we had one attendee ask a question about, they say like they never really liked Seinfeld because it's a show about nothing. So they were curious. Um, why you chose to use Seinfeld as a show that talks about Judaism and parenthetical Jews. And last question. Hi. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful um, presentation. Thank you for making us laugh in these times. I have a, a question which has to do with the word or concept unstable. And what I mean is that... Um, you talked about how these categories are, are um, impermeable and, and they're marked and the Jews become in good standing. But then if you think about anti-Semitism, you think you have to put in something like the, the categories are unstable, meaning that they can be easily reversed. And I don't know how to address that or think about it. And I'm wondering what you think. All right, one last question. Okay. 
And then Phil, I think, will be able to convince him to stay here a few extra minutes afterwards in case you have additional comments that you want to share or questions you want to share with him personally. All right. So, and my question is a good segue from the most recent question. Um, I probably the only person in the room who didn't watch any of these sitcoms at the time. And I have to say, thank you. I, I was saying I may be the only person here who did not watch any of these sitcoms at the time. And I did find them momentarily funny, one in particular, but mostly in a post-October 7 world, I found them very troubling. And I was very upset about the images of the Jews, and I don't know how other people react to that in the through the current lens. And all right. so we're gonna, we're just going to cut off questions here. We could go on all afternoon. I know there's so many folks who have their hands up around the room, um, but we're going to turn over to to Phil. Yeah, yeah. thanks, and I, and I apologize for going all the way to time. I I. Uh, um, well, here we are. So I'm, I'm going to try to hit, hit, hit as many of these uh, in depth as possible. In terms of the question, was it deliberate that Costanza wasn't Jewish? Um, I don't know. I don't have any. Couldn't find anything where Larry David or Jerry Seinfeld says specifically um, Costanza, you know, is modeled on Larry David. So that's interesting. But there is theory. There is a, t a term um, that I didn't introduce in, in some of the literature about comedy about the crypto Jew. Meaning the idea is that you do get figures there uh, because Jewishness is so easily detachable, you can throw it onto the Irish and the Italians, which I think speaks a little bit to your point. Um, in addition, I'll say there is this question, it came up around Maestro with Bradley Cooper, this question of non-Jews playing Jews. Um, you know, and I think I, it, this is my opinions, you take it with, you know, a lump of salt, but you know, I do think the fact that we have a long history in American media as being so easily uh, moving in between, can we jettison what makes us particular, we take back what makes us particular, um, unlike other minorities, we have been depicted as parenthetically Jewish. I think that allows, rightly or wrongly, um, that allows casters, casting directors, and producers to play with. Jewish ethnicity in ways that they would never touch with other ethnicities. Um, but I, yeah, but I think this process comes first, the process of, of the acquisition of Americanness, and then you lose your, your claims on particularity. Uh, Gladys and Bewitch, I think, absolutely falls into this category. Um, and the Golden Girls are, I mean, the Golden Girls are, are, are totally in this, in this, um, in this vein, and, and um, there's a lot to say there. Um, about other categories. Um, Jesus is white. I, you know, I don't know enough about the history of iconography. Um, I, obviously, there's discourse about Jesus is white being depicted as white in American culture today, and there's a big uh, pushback from the left about that. Um, my gut is that because so much of American Christianity was filtered through Western European Christianity, is that that may have an earlier story that I don't have a thing that's not an American story in which, you know, was, does Jesus look French? And, you know, at what, what point does Jesus start looking French, for example? Um, so, but that's a great question to look into. Um, uh, okay. Unstable categories. Yeah, I think, I think whiteness is an unstable category. I think what was being attempted with Jewishness here by American sort of culture is to destabilize the category of Jewishness. Um, so that we can move back and forth in between, uh, you know, in between Americans and not Amer and you know, the majority and the minority, so to speak, not demographically, but in how we're perceived. Um, and the question, and I think, you know, a, a lot of Jewish history, not all of Jewish history, but a lot of Jewish history, especially in Europe, comes down to the fact that uh, uh, the 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 um, Belonging to the in-group card, so to speak, the card of you know the membership card you get when you get stamped as a good German in in, in 1867, for example, or you get stamped as a good American in 1965, for example, that card gets taken away all the time. That's sort of the story, and I think that's not just the Jewish story. I think that's a story of all minorities uh, in systems where their civil rights are totally control controlled by a different in-group. Um, 
Uh, discomfort. Yeah. So I, you know, it's, it's, um, everybody deserves to feel safe. Everybody deserves to feel emotionally safe and obviously physically safe. And in positions where um, people, because of their identity, can feel um, destabilized by certain types of media. I think those people have a right to, whoever they may be, have a right to say, this isn't for me and I don't feel safe here with this content. Um, I also think that that, despite how it's portrayed, I think, when we read about, you know, on college campuses, people, you know, professors getting canceled or things like that, I think despite the sort of firmness with which we discuss it, I think that's actually a real spectrum. I think discomfort is an inherent part of my experience immediate. Now, I am cisgendered, white, male, straight, you know, Jewish in a Jewish setting, you know, I'm not doing this in, uh, I'm not, I'm not going up, up to Goshen in, in, in Pennsylvania and talking to a church, right? So I feel very privileged to, to, to sit with my discomfort. Um, and I think that's a choice. I don't think there's a right answer. I don't think there's an expertise on that. I think the answer is, is you, you, you do what you can to feel safe and you do what you can to live with the discomfort and say, well, what is this about for me? And what am I learning about myself and what am I learning about the world? But I think discomfort is natural in comedy. Um, and I'm going to leave it there. And yeah. on that note, 1990s sitcoms gave us some very superficial ways of understanding Jews and Jewishness, and this talk was anything but superficial. So Dr. Phil Kiesman, thank you so much for being here, for your insights, your wisdom, and thank you all for joining us. Have a good day.